Hi, good afternoon and welcome back to the College Success Mastery Virtual Summit, Day 2, Session 2. I'm Joey Ban from Edu Experts, your host at this summit. Well, this is an exciting session. We have got two speakers in this panel sharing their expertise and experience on admissions to the University of Oxford and Cambridge. They are the oldest, wealthiest and most famous universities in the United Kingdom. Tom Hall studied classics at both Oxford and Cambridge, providing him with an insight into the admission systems at both universities. During his time, he has experienced over 100 tutorials and works with many students, giving him a detailed sense of what tutors want from applicants. Our second speaker is a fellow Malaysian, Thomas Kui. Born and bred in Penang, Malaysia, Thomas is an avid inventor, researcher, and science communicator. He's an alumni of Chongling High School in Penang and is currently a student at the University of Cambridge, pursuing a degree in natural sciences. So without further ado, let's welcome Tom and Thomas onto the summit. Hi, Tom and Thomas. Hi, how are you? Hi. 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 Right, okay. So Thomas is actually back in Penang in Malaysia right now. Uh, and Tom is speaking to us from the UK. Okay, so I'll hand over the session to both of you and I'll be back for the Q&A later. Right. Okay, thanks very much, Joey. It's really good to be here. So there are three big things we're going to talk about uh, today. So firstly, I'm going to give an introduction um, about what's unique, what's different about these universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, secondly, I'm going to give you a short guide to the application process because it's a bit different from other universities, the process of getting in. Um, and finally, Thomas is going to talk to you about what, um, what's different about applying as an international student, um, the specific requirements, as well as the scholarships that are available uh, when you are applying for abroad. So if you give me a minute, I'm going to share my screen. I've got some slides and we'll get right into it. Okay, um, so let's start off with what's unusual, what's unique about Oxford and Cambridge. So this is a picture uh, of me looking a lot younger um, and it was taken on the final day of my university exams um, and I'd just, just been through this uh, traditional process um, called trashing, which is when you come out of your final exam and your friends throw all this confetti and other stuff over you um, and it's a way of forgetting the exam um, that you've just done. Now the reason why I chose this picture um, is because it's a tradition that only exists, uh, I think only in Oxford actually, it's not, it's quite, it's a little bit different in Cambridge um, and it's just a sign of how weird and unique these two universities are. So around my picture um, I've got a list of the things that I think make Oxford and Cambridge completely different from anywhere else. So I'm going to start up here and I'm going to work round clockwise. Um, you can see in this picture I'm a bit sort of dazed, a bit confused um, and exhausted and the reason why that is is because um, the uh, Oxford and Cambridge have a different way of structuring their academic year. So in other universities generally you might have two long semesters. In Oxford and Cambridge you have three terms, each of them is eight weeks long. Um, which is very short and what that means is that you go all out for the time you're there. It is a full-on sprint. Um, so that has a few consequences. It means that you have longer holidays, which are really nice, um, but it also means that the Oxbridge experience when you're there is as more intense than anything else um, I've ever experienced. The second thing is societies. You might see if you look closely that I've got a crown on my head here. Um, and that was given to me by um, some friends that I made um, as editor of the undergraduate newspaper. Um, and that's an example of one of the societies um, that makes Oxford and Cambridge particularly unique. So these are student societies. Every university has student societies, but the general rule is that those in Oxford and Cambridge are bigger, better, um, better funded, more dynamic, um, and it's one of the things that makes the student experience out of this world. Thirdly, traditions. Um, I've already introduced you to one particularly unusual um, Oxbridge tradition, but there are hundreds 
Um, these are the oldest universities, as Joey said, in the country. Um, and as a result, there are strange traditions and features um, of the Oxbridge experience um, that make you feel like you're on another planet while you're there in a good way. Um, and I'm, I'm, I haven't even got to the bottom of half of them. Um, it's, a, it's a very unusual and very exciting experience. Admissions I'm going to talk about um, sort of for the second half of my bit. So I'm going to park that for now. Um, there's just two more things I want to talk about. One is colleges. So most universities operate as one big centralised campus. Everything is organised by the university. Whereas, as you might know, Oxford and Cambridge are split up into 30 to 40 uh, individual colleges of about 300 to 500 people. And these are little communities um, in which you live and work and study. So I'm just going to go back to the previous slide. This was Magdalen College, where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, and this is King's College, Cambridge, where I did my master's degree. Um, and these are the communities you spend all your time in. Um, and it means that you have a tight, um, intense, friendly community, which makes um, this experience of studying uh, all the more enriching. And the final thing, which I'm sure you will have heard about, is the teaching experience. Um, unlike most universities, the way that the, the, the core of the Oxford and uh, Cambridge experience um, is that you will be given an essay to write. It's slightly different in sciences, but this is the general rule. You're given an essay to write. It will be about 2,000 to 3,000 words. You go away, read lots of material, research it, and then you discuss the work you've done um, in a group of maybe one, two, three students with the tutor, which means that you have a teaching experience that is a conversation directly between you and the expert who's teaching you, rather than um, a lecture hall where a tutor is speaking to you know, hundreds of students. What that means is that you get much more of an opportunity at Oxford and Cambridge. I think this is the best thing about it for the exchange of ideas between tutor and student. So the next question, um, now that I've sort of talked about what's unusual about these spaces, is which one you should choose. And the basic answer is either it doesn't really matter, okay? Um, both of them are equally prestigious. It's about as hard to get into Oxford as it is to get into Cambridge. You'll be working very hard at both um, and you'll have that college experience that I talked about in either Oxford or Cambridge. There are two, I think, important differences. The first is the difference in the cities where the universities are. Oxford is a bigger city. Um, it has more businesses. It has more going on in it apart from the university. Cambridge is smaller. It's more old fashioned. It's probably prettier. Um, and that means it feels a bit more Harry Potterish if you go to Cambridge than if you go to Oxford. Um, the flip side is that in Oxford, there's more to do. Um, so you will have your own preference about what style you prefer, but that's a factor to take into account when you make your decision. The next thing um, that I think is properly different between these two is the way they structure their academic year. So both universities um, divide their year into three terms, like I said, those three sprints. Um, but in Cambridge, you generally have a big set of exams at the end of each academic year. Um, and the year is almost a, is a build up to that. So the workload increases the further through the year you get. And then after you've done your exams, there's a big week um, of parties after that, which is a lot of fun. Um, whereas in Oxford, you generally have only two main sets of exams, one at the end of your first year and the other at the end of your third. Um, and that means that you will have a summer, probably in your second year, where you have no exams, which is amazing. It means that the workload is spread more evenly over the whole of your course. Um, and it also means um, that you don't have this big build up and excitement of finishing exams at the same time every year. So again, different students will have different preferences. It's up to you, both are fantastic choices. So that's what's unique and special about Oxford that, you know, and, and Cambridge. So if you've made up your mind that you want to go there, the question is, is it possible? And the answer is effectively yes, it is difficult to get into Oxford and Cambridge, but it is possible. So what I've done here is I've taken some average admission statistics from the years 2015 to 19. So this is a five year period and I've compared how 
how difficult it is to get into Oxford and Cambridge. So you'll see that in this period, Oxford had slightly more applications than Cambridge did. Um, and in fact, Cambridge, although it received fewer applications, gave more offers. And what you'll see there is that of the proportion of, of the students who applied, um, a significantly higher proportion of Cambridge applicants got offers um, than those from Oxford. So you might be thinking, oh, well, it, it looks like it's more difficult to get into Oxford than it is to get into Cambridge. But that's not the whole story. And it's not the whole story because um, the offer will give will say what grades you need to get at A level in order to take up your place. And you'll see from this slide that of the 16.9% of students who got offers from Oxford, almost all of them ended up studying there. That means that almost all of them got the grades they needed to take up their offer. Whereas in Cambridge, you'll see there's a big drop off from 25.3% down to 19.8. And that's because Cambridge often requires that you get higher grades in order to meet your offer and start studying. So what does that mean? Well, it means that Cambridge generally requires students to get higher A-level grades, but it might be slightly more generous in giving offers. Um, but you'll see that when we get down to it, the difference isn't that much. And it's between sort of one in five and one in six students um, who apply, who end up studying there. So it's difficult, like I said, but it is also possible. The next question might be, how good do I need to be? Now that's a very difficult question because it depends on the subject, it depends on the student, um, and it's a very individual process as we're going to see. But I want to give you a general idea of how good you need to be. So what I've done is I've taken the A-level grades um, that students who ended up studying at Oxford in 2019 actually achieved. So I've chosen this statistic because it shows you, it gives you a snapshot of the level that Oxford students are uh, attaining at A-level, which is a sort of readily comparable um, indicator of, of achievement. And what you'll see basically is that you don't need all A stars, okay? So most of, uh, only, only this many students got all A stars, but you do probably need to be the kind of student who gets all A's because all of these students here got three A's or higher. So I think if you're thinking about whether I'm the right kind of student for this, um, one place to start might be to think, well, what kind of A-level grades or equivalent do I expect to get? If the answer is something like three A's or higher, then this is something you should be seriously considering as an option. So let's say we've decided that we're gonna give this a try. What's next? Well, we go through the admissions process. And I've just sketched out here the various steps that you need to go through in order to get your place at Oxford or Cambridge. And it's the same for both universities. Firstly, you pick a subject. Let's say we pick law. You pick a college that you want to apply to. That's a slightly unusual feature. So let's say we want to apply to King's College, Cambridge. You then have to apply through the UK admission system, UCAS. There was a talk on this yesterday, um, which you can find on the Facebook page. Um, the most difficult part of that is a personal statement of about 600 words that you're going to need to write, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You need references from your teachers, you need to submit some examples of your schoolwork. Um, for most subjects, you'll be asked to sit an aptitude test before you go for interview, um, which is, to, we'll talk about that a bit more in a second. And then finally, there's the famous interview. So these three starred items here, I'm going to expand on a little bit more because they're a bit unusual and I'll take them in this order. So I'll talk about statement, then test, then interview. So firstly, the statement, this is an unusual feature of applying to UK universities um, and people often get confused about what it's for. So I'm going to break it down for you very simply. What you're doing is you're telling the story of your interest in the subject you're applying for. So if I'm applying for law, I'm, I'm telling the story of how I became interested in law and how I developed that interest in law. Now, when, so you want to convince your reader that you really are interested in the subject you're applying for. Now, a lot of students fall into a trap. They think the way to do that is to say, I am very passionate about law and find 15 different ways of doing that. That's the wrong approach. The right approach is to show rather than tell your reader that you're interested by telling them what you've read 
about your subject. So what are the books about law that you've read? What have you done? What are the extracurricular activities you've done to learn more about your subject outside of the classroom? Then you tell your reader what you found interesting about that because that shows that you've had interesting thoughts about the things that you've read. You haven't just done them, you've thought about them. And then the best thing of all is if you can say that the things you've read and done changed your opinion about your subject, gave you new ideas. And the reason why that's good is because it shows your reader that you're the kind of student who thinks about the evidence and then forms a conclusion based on what the evidence suggests. And that suggests you're the kind of student who they can teach and who will learn as they go along through independent study. And you generally want to talk about three to five themes in your personal statement. And there's a huge amount to say on this topic. So I'm just gonna flag these two links here. These are two blogs that I've written on this subject of the personal statement. And I suggest you go away and read them because they're very detailed um, and they'll give you everything you need to know. So let's talk about the pre-interview tests. For most subjects, um, it, there will be a requirement that you sit an aptitude test. This is designed effectively to measure how good you might be at the subject with lots of teaching rather than how good you already are. Okay, so these are puzzles effectively for most subjects, lateral thinking puzzles that are designed to test the way you think. So there's an example here from uh, the thinking skills assessment, which is what you need um, to get in for um, philosophy, politics and economics at Oxford, as well as some other subjects. Um, and you'll see that this is effectively a puzzle. You've got two diagrams showing information about two cars, got one that is more expensive, older, faster, bigger, and you've got to say which of these statements about the cars is incorrect. Okay, now this is actually quite an easy exercise. Um, the, the incorrect answer is the cheaper car is bigger because we can see um, that the cheaper car is car one here and it's also the smaller car. So that's got to be false. Um, but you have to do this under time pressure. You have to do loads of these very quickly and it would be easy to make a mistake. So they're testing your ability to think clearly under pressure um, and that's something that is true of most of the tests for most of the subjects. Um, to find out what test is required you do something like this you go to the subject page which you can find on Google so Oxford PPE for uh, philosophy politics and economics you navigate to that you find out what the admissions requirements are then you can click through and get past papers and that will allow you to practice and that's the best way to prepare. So finally Let's say you do all of that successfully, you get to interview. This is a huge topic um, and there's a lot of misconceptions about interview um, because people um, like to share horror stories about the horrible questions that people get asked. The reality is that interviewers generally these days want to see you at their best and they will ask you sensible questions. Questions are generally on one of two things. Either they will give you a problem um, to solve, so they might give you a piece of text or they might give you, um, um, you know, depending on the subject, some sort of maths problem uh, to look at for a few minutes and then answer some questions. Or they, will, might, they might, and they'll probably do both at various points, um, ask you about your personal statement, ask you questions about your interest in the subject. But whatever format the interview takes, there are five things that always help. The first is practice. Get your school to arrange mock interviews because that's the only way you learn how to do this skill. The second is preparation. A lot of students put lots of impressive things in their personal statement, get asked questions about them at interview and aren't able to answer them because they haven't prepared properly. So you need to revise your personal statement like you're going into an exam. The third thing is pauses. Many students are asked difficult questions. You will always be asked difficult questions in interview. The thing to do is not to start talking straight away. What you should do is pause, take time to think, consider your answer, don't be afraid of the silence, and then give a better one. Um, and that's something that sounds easy, but is very hard to do, so you need to practice that. Fourthly, personality. Uh, people often think that you need to come across a certain way, you need to sound clever, or you need to appear very confident. That's not true. What your interviewer wants is to see you being yourself. So the best thing you can be in an interview is yourself. And finally, plasticity, which is really just another word for flexibility. 
You will be challenged in an interview. They will ask you tough questions. Don't be afraid when you're asked tough questions to change your mind if the evidence changes, okay? So those are my big five tips for interview. Um, I hope that's given you a helpful overview of the admissions process. I'm now gonna hand over to Thomas, who's gonna talk about applying from overseas. Thanks very much. So. Okay, so just now Tom has um, been explaining about colleges. So in Cambridge, there are actually 31 colleges and the colleges are actually ranked by a system called the Tomkins table. So each college will like um, compete with, with each other and see which one is better. And these two, the top colleges are famous for its alumni. So Christ College is famous for Charles Darwin, the father of evolution and Trinity College is famous for many, many scientists, especially Isaac Newton. So um, Cambridge is basically quite famous for science, but um, its art is equally good as it seems. And the other thing is Cambridge colleges are very close to each other. So it's basically 10 to 15 minutes walk. So you can basically have a different community because each college represents a different um, culture in terms of um, its size, um, its community, and its alumni. Okay, next. So just now, Tom has also explained that it's really, really difficult to apply to Cambridge um, and Oxford as well. And for sciences, actually, to get into um, Cambridge as an international student, you actually need quite a high score to enter. So the typical that you want to set as a science student is um, you have to averagely get 95 percentile and above and that's actually quite a high score and the other thing to note that is um, it's you'll get a higher chance to get into um, Cambridge um, especially for sciences and arts I think as well um, is by having international achievements um, especially if you have Olympiad, um, Olympiad competitions and you hold like medals in international level. And now I'm going to share with you some pictures of as an undergraduate. So I'm personally a natural science student, so I have long hours of labs um, every week and also lectures. So this is how lectures would look like in Cambridge. And you also have some fun, especially like you get to enjoy some very nice sceneries because the buildings are quite old. But in the inner side of the building is actually pretty modern because they keep refurbish um, the whole building. And Cambridge and Oxford are also famous for its punting because we have rivers. For Cambridge, it also has like very good library, like you have a lot of books and you can borrow them for three weeks and you have like catering for each own colleges and it's famous Harry Potter formal dinners. Next I'm going to talk about like A-level colleges. How do you choose A-level colleges in Malaysia to maybe help you get better chance to apply to Oxford or Cambridge? So these are the um, statistics that I have been collecting and this is 2019 statistic. So for KYUEM, it has the most application, like 35, because it's one of the schools where most scholars go, like um, JPA scholars, Petronas scholars are sent there. And um, the offers are also the top in Malaysia, which are nine offers, and there were eight, acceptees, um, eight acceptances, because someone might not be able to meet the offer. And the next one, will be KTJ, College Tunku Jafar, which is in um, closer to the other part of KL. One, this one is closer to Slango, and the other one, um, KTJ is closer to KL or Malacca. And the other one is Methodist College KL, MCKL, which has 16 applications and four offers, and the rest are having less applications and less offers. 
And what scholarship to apply? So you can actually apply from this um, website, it's called After Schools, and it will actually update you on what Malaysian scholarships that will be offered. Um, and it will tell you the deadline and what kind of amount that they will be sponsoring you. And do you, are you bonded to the um, company as well? So these are all the international scholarship that will be funded fully by this company. Um, and usually they will be funded to SBM students. But for IGCSE students, um, once you finish a level, you can actually apply for Kazana Global Scholarship as well. But for the rest, um, you need to achieve very good SPM scores as well to um, be eligible to apply for this um, scholarship, especially having an, at least an A in Bahasa Malaysia. Next, I'm going to talk about interviews. How does interview work um, if you are an overseas applicant, especially as a Malaysian? So this year, we won't have any interview in Malaysia because um, because of COVID-19. So they will be having virtual um, Skype interview, but Oxford applicants will always have Skype interview. It's just Cambridge that the professors will come to Malaysia and interview the applicants locally. So if you want to apply to overseas, like interview at overseas, like at Cambridge, you can also do that as well. But that's actually quite costly unless you are able to pay so. If not, the fee that you have to pay for, an local, for the local interview is only 50 pounds. But then as an international student who wants to apply there, you also have to fill in other forms. So the additional forms besides UCAS is COPA, which is specifically for Cambridge. Oxford doesn't have that. And the other form that you have to fill in is SAQ. Both of these, you can find it in the website. And they will also require you to print out some transcript of your IGCSE scores and SPM scores as they will look into that and take that into account as well. Because you won't be having the real examination scores yet, so all the scores will be predicted by your teacher during the application. And the next one is the eligibility of um, interview locally. So as a science students and engineering students, all those more well-known courses then you are able to um, do that locally. But then if you are applying to this specific course, such as architecture, classics, history of arts, music, you have to interview at Cambridge. And for local interview, the typical interview date will be around 20 to 22. And once you have applied it and you are successfully um, being eligible for the interview, they will actually send you an email to, to notify you that when is the interview date, um, what's the day, what's the time, and then where is the location. For example, mine was in Taylor's, and then who is the interviewer, which you can stop for a bit and to know their background before you, went to the, before you go to the interview. And there is also a written assessment, which I will be talking about it later. And the next thing to note is that as an international student, you have also have to sit for certain English tests to prove your English um, proficiency. So the first one is, which is the most famous one, is IELTS test. Um, Cambridge requires a very high IELTS score. Typical school will usually require to, you to score for like six and until 6.5 the most. But then for Cambridge, they require you to get a band 7.5 and each component, reading, writing, listening, and speaking, you have to score a minimum of seven in each component. The highest band score is band nine for the IELTS test. You can also take the other tests like TOEFL or Cambridge English, Eng English test. Um, you can have CPE or CAE. CAE is, is the least, and your minimum score is 193, which is a B. And for Singaporeans, you also can take this test. Next, I'm going to talk about the cost. So the, the cost will be broken down into three parts. The first one is tuition fee. Tuition fee are being categorized based on the types of um, subjects that you are taking. So usually from arts subject, you have like lower um, amount to pay. Whereas for science subject, especially medic and veterinary science, you have a very high cost to pay for just the tuition fees. 
and um, this is for international students. Um, for local students, which are from UK, they actually have to just have to pay very little amount, which is four times less than international students, around nine thousand pounds for um, science subjects. And the second one is college fees. So as I have mentioned just now, we have thirty one college in Cambridge, and each college will require you to pay a certain amount of money um, as maintenance fee and also for um, fees like supervision, kitchen fixed charge and other stuff. And the third one is living cost. Um, these are separate and it depends on how much you are going to spend. And if your spending behavior is quite high, then um, it will be higher than this 11,000 pounds. Now, the important dates. So there are a few important dates that you have to follow up. Before 20th of September, you have to start preparing for your interview and your personal statements already. And this is the time where you have to start to submit your COPA, your, your UCAS application, and your transcript. This is for Malaysia and Singapore, which is typically early than, earlier than other countries. And the next date to, remind, to, be, to remember to submit is um, the 26th of September, which is the SAQ. You can also find it in the website. And this is the date where the pre-interview assessment must be registered. So what is pre-interview assessment? It's the assessment that um, Tom has shown just now, um, which requires you to think fairly quickly and work under stress. And that, that is the test ability of how fast you think in the examination. So um, you have to apply this under an exam institution or under your college and they will help you to um, register it and then yeah, you'll sit for the exam during the 31st of October, usually. And then for Malaysians, you, if you do it locally, your interview will be around October. And if you are doing it overseas, then your interview date will be around December. So the next one is in the late January, around the second week or third week of January, you'll be notified about the decision of your interview. Is it successful or is it not? And the offers will be usually the conditional offers, which requires you to get a minimum grade, for example, three A stars in your examination, like A levels. And the academic year will start during October of that following year. So now um, I'm going to explain more about um, more specific subjects. So for natural sciences, the typical offers um, and the minimum grades that require is A star, A star, and A. So the subjects that you need to take are biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, and for the maths, not including psychology. That's what they require. And if you are applying for natural sciences, then you have two pathways to apply. The first one is biological natural sciences, and the second one is physical natural sciences. Each interviewers are different, and they'll ask you if you are applying for biological natural science, you'll be asked a lot more on biology than physics, and you have less maths question, or the maths question will be more about statistics. Another thing is the admission assessment. So for natural science, the admission assessment is NSAA. So the NSAA will be split into two parts this year. They have changed the format. So the first section is multiple choice questions. And the second one is also, it used to be subjective questions, but they have changed it to multiple choice questions. Okay, for medicine, the typical offer is A star, A star, A. And they require you to work in certain medical um, institution before you start applying. And the paper that you have to sit for is BMAT. For engineering, the typical offer is A star, A star, A. And you will be required by some colleges to sit for stat papers, which is a very hard maths paper. But then you have to look at specific college to see if they require that. If not, you'll be sitting ANGA test, which is engineering specific admission assessment paper. And it will be separated into two parts. So for section one is multiple choice questions. And the second one is as well is multiple choice question, but it's advanced physics, so it's harder. And there's no calculator allowed in this test. So you have to 
train your own math skill and then try not to use calculator when you're doing mathematics. For psychology, the offer is lower a bit, slightly lower, but not as low, which is A star 8A. And there are no specific cost requirement. They don't they also don't have any admission assessment. Only some colleges will let you have an in at interview written assessment, which means before the interview they will give you like certain um test to write down before you go into the interview. But then um, for OSC applicants, you don't have to do that. That's, that only applies for international, um, those who go to Cambridge to um, interview. Whereas for computer science, um, the typical offer is A star, A star, A. And the, it has also got its own test. The admission test is called CTMUA. And the papers are separated in this format, which is um, the math mathematical thinking multiple choice question. Both are multiple choice, and there's again no calculator allowed. For chemical engineering, it's separated from engineering. It's a bit more special than engineering because you can enter it through different routes. So there are two different routes that you can enter. The first one is engineering route, which you apply it through engineering, which means your first year will be sharing the same course as engineers or you can apply through natural sciences, which means your first year will be studying with natural scientists. And only then second year and third year, you'll be having your own chemical engineering course. So the assessment format will be the same depending on which branch you want to go in from. So for natural science, you'll be taking NSAA and for engineering, you'll be sitting for ANGAR. And mathematics, the test is step papers and the offers are A star, A star, A. So assessment for and for that papers will just be um, maths questions, like really hard maths questions. Um, that's the end for the um, sciences. Now I'm going to talk about the assistance that you can find from. So as a Malaysian, you can actually seek help from Cambridge University Malaysian Society, where they actually provide a lot of help um, if you need. And you can actually find Kumas. Um, they will have like events such as um, this out outreach event. And then this outreach event will share with you how does Cambridge supervision work. And you can basically experience by like seniors becoming the tutor and juniors um, be the super be the students and then experience how um, the supervision will work in real life. And finally, when you got the offer, right, you actually have um, the Kumas will actually organize an activity where all Malaysians will meet together before they um, go to UK, back to UK. And then it's like, you can have like some friends before you go there so that you are not alone when you are in a new environment. So that's the end and good luck for your application. All right, thank you, Tom and Thomas for your session. Um, Participants, if you have questions, uh, you can type your questions in the chat box now and we'll come to your questions. All right. Okay, I, I have a question here. Um, so for, for either Tom or Thomas, uh, does Oxford or Cambridge uh, offer, universe, uh, offer scholarships? I mean, the university itself. Does it offer scholarships to international students? So um, <clears throat> I think it, it does. The, there are more scholarships available, far more scholarships available at graduate level than at undergraduate level. Um, but the university, I think, well, so my experience is in Oxford, most of the scholarships uh, that the university offers are based on financial means. So lower income students, uh, there are scholarships available for them. Um, there are also lots of specific scholarships um, depending on, you know, so there was, for instance, I had a friend who was funded by, uh, who's a Muslim friend who was funded by the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies. So there are specific scholarships um, based on background. But I think that, the, I, that basically the, the position is, I, I, maybe uh, Thomas will be able to speak more about Cambridge, my understanding is for undergraduate level, most of the scholarships available are based on background and finances rather than uh, merit. 
Yeah, most likely yeah. not married because everybody is so good, right? It's, it's like... Effectively, <laughs> yes. Well, my understanding is that once you get the offer, they will actually ask you if you have specifically like some music, uh, musical capabilities. So if you are good at certain musical instrument, then you might be eligible to apply for um, there's a scholarship called Organ Scholar, and you will be helping um, some colleges to do shapeo services. So that's one of the way that you can get scholarship. And the other one is just grants. So like Tom said, it's based on your um, financial needs and it's not based on merits. Okay, uh, I think there's a question in the chat box. Maybe Tom wants to take that. Or um, so yes, okay, I'm just gonna read it for a second. Um, so the question is what got you into Cambridge or Oxford? Um, what other extracurriculars other than international competitions can increase chances? Um, and how effectively how important are extracurricular activities? So <clears throat> I think what I would do, what I would say is there's a big difference between um, say the approach that U US universities have and the approach that Oxford and Cambridge have. So they're not worried it, it, about extracurricular activities specifically. What they want um, you to show is that you're interested in your subject, okay? So that requires you to have done stuff other than studying it in school, um, but reading is an extracurricular activity. And if you can show in your personal statement that you have read, gone beyond the curriculum and read a lot of extra stuff, that's probably the most important way you can demonstrate interest. Um, what the other things you can do depend on your subject, okay? So if you are applying for law, then there might be, you know, uh, lectures available for high school, school students in your local area about law. And if you can go to those, then that shows interest beyond the school curriculum. Um, what's less important is, you know, sports um, and music and charity work and that sort of thing, which are important for US universities, but Oxford and Cambridge are less interested because it's all about showing your interest in the subject. Okay, there's another question in the chat. Experience. Pertaining hmm. to medical sciences. I'm not a medical student myself, but um, according to the website, it's you just have to work under a medical department or work as a doctor or um, as an observant in certain hospital. Yeah, yeah. My, my impression is that medical students that I knew um, had, would generally um, have done a bit of work experience with a doctor that they knew. Um, and there are, I think, I mean, in the UK, I think some, some hospitals provide work experience for high school students, but it depends on what's on offer locally. So I think the idea is do whatever work experience you can get um, in the medical profession, and that will be great. Um, but that's just, I mean, it, it, it's once you've done some, that's probably you know, that, that might well be enough. Um, it's not the most important feature um, of the application, but it is something that you ought to have done a bit of. All right, the next question, how difficult is the mathematics degree in Oxford? I think every <laughs> subjects are equally <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Can't help. Everything is difficult, but I guess yeah. if you're admitted, then you should have the ability to <laughs> you know, cope with classes, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I, mean, have, I have a question for Tom. Um, what's your advice for students choosing, you know, between the different colleges? Oh, I, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, so some people like to say, it doesn't matter what college you end up at, they're all great. And that's true to some extent. Um, there are a few things that I would look at. So one of them, uh, Thomas has already talked about, which is the college fees. So some colleges are more expensive to live at um, than others, and you'll be able to find that out from college websites. Um, so if that's a factor, then look at that. Um, look at, there will, there will be more virtual tours of colleges available. Look at the buildings. 
um, decide, because, because they're all beautiful, but they're beautiful in very different ways. Some are more modern, some are very ancient, some are very grand, some are quite small. Um, you will have a preference um, about what kind of environment you think you would like to look at every day. Um, so look at that. The other thing you should look at is how the accommodation works. So some, um, some colleges, you will be living inside the college for every single year of your degree. Other colleges expect you to find your own accommodation for maybe the middle year of your university, which can be very fun because you go out and live in a house in the town with your friends, um, but you, you might have a different preference. So work out how that works. Um, and I think you, those are sort of the main, the main factors. The other thing you might want to consider, um, and I think this is more significant for arts and humanities subjects than it is for science subjects, but um, the, the people who, the, the subject uh, tutors at that college, because a lot of teaching is done in arts and humanities in particular within the college. So if, there's, if there are a few people you think you particularly want to be taught by, then you have a higher chance of being taught by those people if you apply to that college. Um, what fact, a factor that you shouldn't take into account, and this is I think as important as anything else, is um, how difficult you think it would be to get into that college. Um, and the reason why that's not important is um, that both Oxford and Cambridge have a very sophisticated system for giving you a second chance if you apply to a college and they don't have enough space for you, but they, they think you're good enough to get into the university. There's a very good system to make sure that you get a chance to be considered by other colleges. That system works very well. And it means if you're good enough to get into Oxford or Cambridge, you will be accepted at a college so you shouldn't consider the college when you're thinking about how hard it is to get in. Yeah, I agree with you, but um, I actually want to add one more point is the location of the college. That is one of my concerns because like, um, I am not the person who likes to walk really far to certain departments. So I will find the college which, which are closer to my department and closer to, because like some college are 30 minutes away from the main department and also 30 minutes away from like the grocery stores and you have to buy stuff mm -hmm. from by walking um, quite a far distance and it's a waste of time. So it's also a personal preference. Okay, um, can you look at the uh, two other questions in the chat? Do sure. Oxford Cambridge um, so value D-O-F-E, what's that? Duke so that's Edinburgh. the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Um, oh. I think the basic answer is not as much as other universities, because as I said earlier, um, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself a bit, but they're interested in how interested you are in your subject. Um, so the sort of thing that D of E might be useful for is if you're applying for medicine, it would be a way of showing some of the skills that would make you a good doctor in dealing with patients. Um, but in general, it's less important um, than your interest in the subject. I think that's, that's the straightforward answer. Um, and then the final question is, is it mandatory to choose a college during application? The answer is no. I think both Oxford and Cambridge, Thomas will talk about Cambridge, but certainly in Oxford, you can make what's called an open application where they will allocate you to a college after you apply. Um, I would advise that you do choose a college just because it gives you a bit more control over the process. And I think psychologically, when you're making an application, People are going to view your application more favorably, even if they shouldn't, if you have said that you want to study at that particular college. Um, they might want to give you a, an offer more than if you just say, I don't, I don't care where I go, give me any college. Um, I think it shows confidence as well, which is good. That's key to a successful application. Hmm. Are there any uh, circumstances where students can apply to both Oxford and Cambridge? No. Nope. At the same time? You can't only apply for one, um, one university, either Oxford or Cambridge. Except at graduate level when you can apply for both. Um, so you, for a master's degree, you can, but for undergraduate degrees, which is what I think everyone else is interested in here, uh, you can't. Okay. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, happiness level. <laughs> uh, What's what students' satisfaction level at are uh, like you know at Oxford or Cambridge? 
because after Shannon's session yesterday, I'm very interested to know, are, are students generally happy? So, um, I think, so student satisfaction is something that is sort of measured uh, statistically, isn't it? That, that, and that's a specific score that different universities have. I actually don't know what the scores are for Oxford and Cambridge, um, but I, I do know that they're very high. They're sort of, like, you know, in the high 90%, I think, I think, but I'd have to check. Um, but but more, I think the more important thing than the stats is um, overall happiness. Um, I would say that, you know, look, these are hard degrees um, and they put you under a lot of pressure. Um, people work very hard. People feel a lot of them. These are natural people who are naturally very motivated, who naturally, you know, naturally quite competitive, who really want to succeed. So people do feel stress. Um, at the same time, stress and happiness are different things. Um, I would say if I think back to my Oxford experience, I was stressed quite a lot of the time, but I was also happy all the time um, because it's a fun kind of challenge. Um, what I would say is that um, the universities are very, very good now. This has got a lot better in the last 15 years um, at dealing with stress. Um, so there are fantastic services. Tutors are now very understanding if you need more time to complete work. Um, and it's not the case that the pressure is coming from your subject tutors. Um, the pressure only comes from you and the support that's available is fantastic. Um, and college communities are hugely uh, supportive, friendly, welcoming places. Um, I was amazed when I arrived because it was so much friendlier than school. Um, it's, it, it, so I think the answer is there is a lot of stuff about it that is stressful but it's also very friendly, very welcoming, very understanding. Um, and the university really does value mental health um, to an incredible degree. And the support is outstanding for people who struggle. All right, is, is there a ratio or quota um, for there, students coming from Asia? There is no ratio for region, regions, but then there is ratio for international applicants versus local applicants. I think for Cambridge, they set it to 50-50. So you have 50% of students which are from international and 50% from UK. But I don't know for Oxford how it works. But I, 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 know, I, I, yeah. I suspect it's similar. Yeah. But maybe for Oxford, um, from my experience for Malaysians, typically you have less offers for Oxford than Cambridge. Yeah. Mm. IB diploma, how does having IB diploma affect the offers being received? Um, Effectively, it doesn't. Um, yeah. They're considered just as valuable as A-levels. Um, so they will, they have a, there is a grid that the university uses. They consider, they use A-levels as the base, I think, and they have, they consider, they sort of read across the IB equivalent. So an IB score of whatever will be equivalent to certain A-level grades. Mm -hmm reference um, you, you your chances are equally good with either okay um i have a, a a question here about preparation so um for for a young student who's interested or who's ambitious you know and who wants to apply to oxford or cambridge um what's what's your advice in terms of the kind of preparation that the student should should have or when does that start i think maybe i should talk about um, arts and humanities and Thomas should talk about science um, and I will I will do this very briefly read a lot about your subject uh, from as early as possible because um, that's going to give you an advantage in two ways it's going to be easier for you to demonstrate interest um, and it's going to mean that when you come to interview um, and when you come to write your application you have more valuable things to say, you have a more sophisticated perspective on your subject, uh, and you're more interesting to listen to. The best thing you can do is read, um, and the, 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 the period when you really need to be doing that more than ever um, is a few months, you know, let's say six months before you submit your application. So let's say March, if you're gonna be applying in September, you really need to be doing that sort of full throttle. Um, and that should be a pleasurable process. Um, and if it's not, then um, you know, perhaps reconsider whether this is what you want to, what you want to do. 
um, and then other, you know, other extracurriculars in the year before you apply, um, you know, connected to your subject are a good idea as well. That, that's my main tip is read, read, read as much as you can. Yeah. Um, for sciences, I actually started to set my goal three years before I want to apply. And yeah, same thing is like, I don't like reading. So I actually watch a lot of science YouTube channels and like their videos to broaden my understanding on sciences. And if I have further interest in it, I will just read out some research papers and to know more about it. Um, for other types of preparation is like more intensive preparation will will be like I, I begin more intensive preparation during three months before the real interview and I went to the internet and find a lot of interview questions that they list there and then I prepare it um, like my own answer and then I jot it down in a note and then after that I will just keep revising my answers and um, you will prepare like 100% or 150%, but the chances of getting those questions are literally 0%. <laughs> but then those, those preparations that you have done will be really helpful during the interview because um, bits by bits of those knowledge will come into play during the real interview. It's just a, an accumulation of knowledge um, from time to time that you have to do. Yeah, so just be consistent for your preparation. Okay. Uh, do you get like sports ex extracurricular? I mean, is, is that important? Uh, not, not when you're applying, but when you get into Oxford or Cambridge, what, what kind of emphasis on non-academic pursuits or uh, activities? You yes. are encouraged. You, I remember when we, when we arrived, there was a, a, a dinner in college three days in after arriving, and we were encouraged by the president of the college to go out and do extracurricular things whether that is sport or music or journalism or debating or anything else um, there's a huge number of societies you're encouraged to do it because it's what makes these universities such vibrant um, and interesting communities um, so obviously you need to find a way of balancing that around your work um, there were times when i worked harder and spent less time on extracurriculars there were times when i worked less hard and spent more time on them um, actually, I think a good experience, a good degree experience should involve you doing both at different times. Yeah, and university will actually have a lot of seminars for sciences and a lot of competitions for you to join, like maybe college matches for different sports. Yeah. Uh, that's a question for you, Thomas. Which college in Malaysia did you, did you go to? Uh, I went to College Yayasan UEM, um, which... Yeah, most scholars will be sent there to study. But then I took the linear program, which is 18 months, um, because I'm not a scholar. Yeah. But you will have yeah, an equal opportunity to get into it. The Oxbridge, yeah. Okay. All right, any more questions from the audience? Um, looks, like, lo looks like we've answered every question uh, in the chat box. Uh, any final advice, um, Tom and Thomas, do you have any final advice for our audience? Yes, Prepare I do. I, I, I would say if you are sitting here and thinking, I'm not sure whether I'm good enough or not, um, the answer is apply. Give it a go because it is, apart from anything else, the process of applying is an amazing experience. Um, it gives you a huge amount of knowledge. It makes you think harder than you've ever thought before. It makes you smarter, basically, the process of applying for Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and it's a lot of fun. You get to explore a subject in more detail than you've ever done before. So whatever your thoughts now, if you're in any doubt, give it a go, because it will be, I guarantee, a fantastic experience. My advice is just keep practicing until you... <laughs> get a very high scores and for the predicted grades you need to make sure that you score really high in all the tests given by your teacher so you leave a very good impression for your teacher in the class all yeah. right okay thank you very much uh tom and thomas for being uh on the summit we will be posting the feedback uh form link right now in the chat box 
Uh, so please uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, to give us your feedback. And uh, we really appreciate that. Okay, so we'll leave the link on for a couple of more minutes. Uh, and we'll see you back again if you're interested to learn about uh, admissions to UK medical schools. Uh, the next session is coming up in about 30 minutes at 4.30 Malaysia time. Uh, if you are watching from Japan, that will be 5.30 your local time. Okay, I will see you back in around 25 minutes. <laughs>